Hello, friends and family, brothers and sisters on YouTube World. It says that we are live. We're back with Larry Johnson, former CIA and also uh, counterterrorism for the State Department. Thank you, Larry, for coming back. We thank you for your time and your knowledge. Go Hi. ahead, Bob. Oh, we also Larry. met with a Bob Precision and a no YouTube friend. Go go check out his content. Go ahead, go ahead, Bob. Hi, Larry. Um, my first question for you is. What do you think the uh, the Arab regimes neighboring Israel? What do you think their response to the Houthis and their blockade of the Red Sea uh, is going to be? Because the acts of the Houthis made them look really bad to the Arab public. I'm talking about countries like Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. What do you think their response will be? Uh, seeing that the Houthis and um, and Hamas itself have basically done a lot of uh, damage to the Israeli brand. Well, are you saying that the, the Arab public was uh, against what the, the Houthis have done? I uh, know they actually are uh, supportive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supportive. Okay, yeah. I, I, mis I misunderstood. And impressed. Yeah, no, it's... It, it puts, if anything, it puts additional pressure on countries like uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey uh, to do something because uh, Yemen's proving to be very, very effective in shutting down uh, maritime traffic to Israeli ports to and from. They have essentially closed the Red Sea, <laughs> which is remarkable. And, you know, the United States can't figure out what to do. So we sent uh, the, this Gerald R. Ford carrier strike group into the Red Sea to sail around and, you know, flex muscles. Uh, but the United States now is sort of like that, uh, you know, this 60-year-old guy with a big beer gut that's out at the beach trying to flex his muscles to impress the women, uh, not being very impressive. They're just saying all they're seeing is the fat belly. And that's sort of what... Uh, the rest of the world is seen because if you notice, uh, there have been no uh, airstrikes <clears throat> against targets in in Yemen, including you know no no cruise missile strikes, which uh, clearly the United States has the capability of doing. And I, my understanding from what I've heard is that um, the military planners at the Pentagon have been very worried. That if they really, if they started getting too aggressive, that the Houthis have in their arsenal uh, anti-ship missiles and could conceivably sink the aircraft carrier, uh, because the destroyers that are accompanying that aircraft carrier have very limited power. Uh, they, they've got, they can fire off, let's say, a hundred missiles, air defense missiles, uh, but uh, once they're out, they're out. There's not the wow. uh, uh, you know, they, they don't just have another ship sell up and uh, offload some new ammunition. They literally have to go to a, a, a port somewhere where there is a stockpile or storehouse of those missiles. So what we got news yesterday that the Gerald R. Ford carrier strike group is being withdrawn from the, from the Red Sea and heading home. Uh, so that means they're going back to refit. Uh, again, it just underscores the limit that these aircraft carriers look big and they look powerful, but really they've got limited capability, very limited capability, and really have no ability to sustain themselves in a prolonged conflict. So, you know, the, the Houthis, the little little bit of Yemen is uh, acting, you know, pretty big. So, Larry, you're saying that basically the Houthis made the American uh the americans flinch they call their bluff and yeah well uh, at least that's how it's going to be viewed by many in the arab world the united states yeah. disagrees oh no 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 that's not not the case we're just we you know the ships had been at sea past their expiration date and they needed to come home to refit uh, right. but we're sending they're sending uh, a marine amphibious landing ship which you got, <clears throat> you got to scratch your head and wonder what the hell are they doing that for? Because they, they certainly don't have the backup to land Marines in Yemen. If they did that, it'd be a suicide mission. 
And those amphibious ships, they're not known for being having air defense systems that can take out uh, missiles as, uh, and drones. So <clears throat> it's a very, very curious move on the part of the U.S. Okay. My other question is, do you think um, there will ever be a coalition like back in the early 2000s that will be headed by the U.S. in mm -hmm. like a military conflict <laughs> yeah. in, 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 the, in, the, in the region? No, I, you saw... Uh, they they tried to pull pull together a, a coalition of the willing, um, <laughs> and initially they said, "Oh man, we got twenty countries. We got France and Italy and Spain and Australia." And then they look around and go, "Whoops!" All those countries said, "No, nah, never mind. We're not going to be part of this." Uh, they, they they could see it was just uh, you know it's a, it was going to be uh, the proverbial shit show. Um, so and the UK goes they send one ship and the one ship they sent has uh, uh let's call it a history of not being reliable mm -hmm. uh, tough they, they can't keep it repaired can't keep it out in the water so i mean it's just uh, it really it's a clown show when you look at this hmm. do you have any questions real true talk yes sir okay um i was going to ask you could you what impact or significant was the deployment of a Iranian warship to the Red Sea amid soaring tensions have? Yeah, just that it, it creates one more uh, can of open gasoline near a flaming fire. You know, this is, um, it, it raises the possibility that at some point uh, the U.S. would engage uh, that Iranian ship. Uh, it's also, but it's it's show of force by Iran, um, sort of tweaking the nose of the United States and its uh, so-called coalition of the unwilling uh, that it can sail into the Red Sea, and you know it's it's there to it's there as I think a sign of support for the Houthis, because Iran has backed the Houthis uh, in their war against Saudi Arabia up until recently. So this is this is just uh, there is a long-standing relationship there between Iran. And the, and the rebels in in Yemen, and so you know this is uh, it. It was it, it's a pretty bold move by Iran. I'll put it that way. I have a question. Okay. I have a question about the other side of the Red Sea, the African coast. Mm -hmm. um, Ethiopia recently just signed a, a memorandum of understanding to um, control one of the. Uh, naval port one of the ports in Somali, it's somali land the breakaway yes. republic of somali land uh do you think that has anything to do with the houthis and the uh red sea blockades uh I, I frankly i don't know i haven't really studied uh i've stayed away from somalia <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, centuries of conflict and uh, back and forth um the, the analysis I have seen uh, just shows that uh, whatever influence the United States was able to exercise in that region in the past is weakening w with each passing day. So, um, you know, this will set up a conflict confrontation between Ethiopia and Somalia and uh, the S Somaliland rebels. And so, you know, it's it's a recipe for, you know, the expanding w a war in the region with uh, already in upheaval. Um, so this, you know, this, this is not a you don't see this as good news that this is going to bring stability to the region. It's, it's likely going to increase instability. Instability. Okay, my next question is, um, I thought you had a follow-up. Um, oh, no. <clears throat> you said that the Israeli army is weak. Can you please elaborate? Well, they're, they're poorly trained, uh, is, is my main point. And uh, poor training makes you weak. Um, I th you know, they've had, they've had several incidents where, uh, you know, the one couple of weeks back where these three Israeli hostages 
managed to escape uh, from Hamas. Uh, and there was an Israeli unit that was uh, it comprised largely of new reservists, uh, we, we subsequently learned. And so they come out with a take their shirts off to show that they don't have any uh, bombs strapped to their body. And they're waving a white flag. And uh, one of the Israeli soldiers began shooting. And then others began shooting. And at least two Israelis, even after they were given an order by the commander to cease fire, they kept firing. Now, <clears throat> the, it, th this highlights a number of things. Number one, it shows that Israel has rules of engagement that allow them to shoot unarmed people, that they're almost encouraged to shoot unarmed people. So right there you have a problem. That, that, that means they're, they're, they're a bunch of damn cowards. Um, then, then number two, uh, the after-action report that was published uh, in, in the Israeli newspapers, it was just shocking in terms of the orders were issued and not obeyed. And the soldiers who didn't obey the order said, well, we didn't think it was permanent. We thought it was just a suggestion or, temp you know. Look, one of the reasons soldiers go through basic training and for an extended period of time, for up to you know three months, is to learn how to obey orders and learn the consequences of what happens to you if you don't obey orders. That's part of building discipline. These guys, the Israeli army is just completely undisciplined. Then the the rank structure, um, they're listing guys who are 21 years old as staff sergeants. Now, a staff sergeant is a non-commissioned officer. Uh, usually is put in charge of, uh, say, uh, a platoon, uh, if not a larger group, it will oversees, uh, basically oversees the work of other sergeants. In the U.S. military, uh, a staff sergeant is between 28 and 30 years old. And, and that means you've been in the Army for eight years, 10 years, you've got some experience, you know what you're doing. Israel doesn't have that. They're, they're making some 21-year-old kid a staff sergeant. You know, he, he, I bet he can barely put his pants on straight. And, and so what, what you wind up with is just this army. It's got all the talent. It's got all the, uh, the terms, the, 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 the titles. They, they dress up in the right ninja gear, but they don't know what they're doing. And we're seeing that right now where uh, the, Israel's having to withdraw several brigades. They're saying it's because of economic reasons, and I'm, I'm sure that's part of it. Uh, they've lost uh, because it's a reserve, the Israeli army, uh, the so-called defense force, I call it the Israeli occupation force, uh, is uh, largely a reserve force, which means it's people, you know, they'll go in, they'll serve an initial uh, period of time, maybe one year, two years max. Then they get out and they have weekend duty, maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. Uh, maybe an extended week, two-week training uh, interspersed here and there. But really, they don't, they don't have a professional military across the board. So these reservists who are working as, you know, they're running uh, McDonald's and, uh, you know, a shawarma stand and a shoe store and an auto repair, you know, they get called into active duty. Their business is closed or oh. is understaffed or, not properly managed. And so that's having a definite economic impact uh, in Israel. But on top of that, um, the Israelis have taken significant casualties. Um, the, the, the death toll is not so great as it, as it is the number that have been wounded in action. Significant. Uh, some are you know, going to be paralyzed for life, have lost limbs. Uh, so it, it's really taking a toll in that regard. And they've lost a lot of vehicles. Uh, because their strategy of, uh, and I predicted this along with several others like Scott Ritter and Doug McGregor, the Israeli strategy of bombing the Gazans into the Stone Age well, it was counterproductive. It's exactly what the Germans did to Stalingrad. Uh, they thought, oh, that's, yeah, we'll destroy the city. That'll root those Russians out. It had just the op exact opposite effect. What it did, it created natural uh, cover and concealment. Uh, the difference between cover and concealment, cover means 
you get behind something and uh, they, they try to shoot at you, the bullet's not going to come through. Concealment means you're just hidden so nobody can see you. But if they did uh, shoot at you, the, you know, the bullet would probably penetrate. Okay. So uh, the, these Hamas fighters and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad as well, and then there's some other groups, uh, are skulking about in these ruins, popping up and you know blasting tanks and, and armored personnel carriers. And that's creating injuries. It may not always kill people, but it, it wounds a lot. So, you know, Israel's pulling out. They said that they were they were there to destroy Hamas. Well, they haven't destroyed Hamas. Uh, they did. The Israelis did carry out uh, an assassination today in Beirut where they oh, yeah. killed the deputy leader of Hamas. And this is, you know, this is going to, I think, really escalate uh, activity in the region. Uh, this is, I think, likely to lead to Hezbollah now becoming more active. And what that means for the Israeli occupation force is they, they don't have the manpower uh, and the staying power to sustain this war. And Netanyahu said, oh, this is going to go on for a long time. Well, they don't have a long time. The Israeli economy can't withstand it. The, and when you look at what the Houthis have done in shutting down maritime traffic in the Red Sea for, uh, going to and from Israel, that's another blow to the uh, economy of Israel. So it's uh, the Israelis are in a they're in a tough position right now, particularly Netanyahu. Uh, so he's facing this growing uh, dissension within uh, his war cabinet. Uh, just the other, I guess it was thir last Thursday or Friday, he wanted to have a press conference. He wanted to do it with uh, Gallant, the defense minister, and Danny Gantz, who is uh, the opposition political leader but um, agreed to come into the war cabinet and to show unity on the part of Israel. Well, you know, Gallant and Gantz told him to go, you know, to go blow it up his ass. They weren't going to show up with him. So, you know, Net Netanyahu ended up canceling the press conference. So when you've got uh, guys like Gallant and Gantz starting to push back publicly in that way against Netanyahu, it's, you know, it's not a good look. This is... Uh, when, when you're you're in a fight, what they say is a fight for their lives. That's uh, kind of disunity doesn't add to your uh, combat effectiveness. Also, it, it's true that um, Hezbollah in Lebanon, they have infinitely more tunnels, infinitely more uh, rocket power, missile power than Hamas. Mm -hmm. So whatever damage Hamas has done to the uh, IDF forces, the occupation forces. Hezbollah will do way more, infinitely more. Well, yeah, I mean, they've already done, they've already emptied out the uh, kibbutzim and settlements that were along the northern border with Lebanon and Syria. Uh, they're empty. So about 100,000 Israeli civilians are now living elsewhere, trying to find alternative housing. They had to leave their homes because of fear so of getting... Uh, hit with uh, mortars, artillery shells, drones, uh, missiles by Hezbollah. And Hezbollah, as you correctly note, is a far more uh, substantial military force and far more capable military force than Hamas. So, uh, and I, I'm just completely mystified why there are so many of these right-wing crazies in Israel that are calling for uh, getting involved, uh, going going to battle with uh, Hezbollah. Hmm. I think it'll be yeah. a walk in the park. They, they didn't learn their lesson in 2006. Yeah. You know, they got beaten. Uh, and Hezbollah, I would argue today, is in, you know far, far stronger, far more capable than the force that the Israelis fought against in 2006. Is this the first time in Israeli history that they actually have displaced Israeli refugees internal refugees in Israel, Israelis leaving their homes to... Well, in this, in the, yeah, in this number. Yeah, this, in this number, yeah. In this number, the fact that you've uh, the, the vacated uh, the, the communities in the Gaza and uh, up north. Yeah, the, this is sort of one of the largest. And let's also note that this is probably the most protracted uh, conflict that Israel has been engaged in, at least um, it's approaching, I guess, the 1982 invasion of Lebanon, 
uh, 81. Uh, I don't recall the precise date. Uh, that may have been longer, but this one is far more cost. This is, I think this is turning out to be the most costly uh, military uh, uh, response by Israel. And it's, it's really, it's so, so unnecessary. Israel had other alternatives. Um, the, they won the initial phase of the propaganda war uh, on October 7th by pushing the lie that uh, Hamas was raping women and beheading children and baking children in ovens. I mean, it was just all damnable lies, but Israel sold it really well. It was widely believed around the world. Um, so at that point, Israel's option would have been to go on the diplomatic route. Uh, to one enlist Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, saying, look, we don't want to go in and hurt the Palestinians, but we want to punish Hamas. Yeah. They would have had some support. The, the, both the Egyptians and Saudis were not any fans of Hamas by any stretch. So uh, Israel had a choice, but that wasn't what Israel wanted to do. Israel wants to eliminate the Palestinians. It's, it's pure genocide. They... They want to do to the Palestinians what the Nazis wanted to do to the Jews in World War II in Europe. They want to er erase them. And they have no regard for their life or welfare. That's why they're indiscriminately killing women, children, uh, of course, men. And, you know, Israel has never learned the lesson. You can't kill your way out of this situation. And it's like this assassination today of this number two guy in Hamas. You know how many times they've assassinated Hamas leaders? I mean, good Lord, they assassinated the founder of Hamas years ago, Sheikh Yassin. Yeah. Did that change anything? No. So it's, you know, it's the definition of insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. Um, and, and so... Israel thinks it can kill its way out of this, and it can't. <clears throat> it's got to deal with the politics of it. And their actions against the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank over the last now approaching three months has turned world opinion against Israel in a way I've never seen in my lifetime. Same. Yeah. Uh, I mean, candidly, uh, I had been a supporter of, of the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., the National Museum. I've been a supporting member since 1993. I've canceled my membership because that museum wants to speak out only about Jewish uh, Holocaust while the, these, the, the Jews in Israel are causing a new Holocaust. You know, we have to have one standard, in my view, and uh, this, uh, this was just wanton murder of women and children, I think, is outrageous. Uh, I have a question on the effect on the Israeli economy. This mm -hmm. conflict is doing a lot of damage to their economy, yeah. more than any other conflict with any uh, Arab nation before. Well, the, um, no. I mean, they've, th th this is, again, this is the, uh, this is almost, uh, this is unprecedented, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, Portugal, yeah. Israel has not had to uh, activate and deploy um, this many reservists, coupled with uh, the maritime, the cutoff of maritime traffic from the south, coupled with it's now basically it's engaged in a war with Hezbollah undeclared. And uh, I, I think what we're going to see is Hezbollah's activities in the wake of this assassination of Hamas uh, number two. Uh, Hezbollah's activity is going to increase. Uh, Sheikh Nasrallah, Nasrallah uh, the leader uh, of uh, Hezbollah, was scheduled to speak tomorrow. He has now canceled that speech. Um, I don't take this as a good sign. This, <clears throat> you know, they're obviously sort of recalibrating what they're going to do, what their next steps forward are. So, you know, we're starting off the new year with uh, prospects of this war widening and getting worse, not not uh, better. Larry, uh, you said that the, the second in command of Hamas was killed or assassinated. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, was was that one of the brothers, uh, Sinar? I think I believe their name is Sinar oh. or no, no, Sinwar. Sinwar. No, this is Al Al Arari, A R O U R I. Okay. Is I think how how he spells his name. Um, okay, and, and then uh, uh, my wife wants to know what are your thoughts on that will impact the U.S. coming upcoming elections. I, I have to get her question in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> Um, the, um, Biden is desperate for a win and he's not getting a win. Uh, the, uh, the war, uh, Israel's war against the Palestinians is driving a big wedge in the democratic party, uh, between in the past, uh, you know, you had the Palestinians, uh, supporting the Democrats, you know, they certainly weren't going to align themselves with the Republicans. But now that you know that's up in the air, uh, they're they're reevaluating their support for the Democrats. Uh, but frankly, I don't know where else to go, because it's not like you know the Republicans are more unified in supporting Israel at any cost at any price. So the, mm. there, it's not like if you support the Republicans, you're going to get a better outcome with respect to Israel. Um, and. Uh, it, but it still leaves Joe Biden as being perceived as weak. I mean, the withdrawal of the carrier strike group this week uh, is is just one uh, going to be used as one other example of uh, Biden's weakness and indecisiveness. And then you couple that with the loss of Ukraine and the you know inability to sustain uh, that war. Uh, the, the fact that uh, Russia is prevailing is going to be sticking in his craw. And uh, then, it, uh, you know, I think I think it's highly unlikely that China is going to make any military move against Taiwan. But Ta China is certainly going to make political moves and may well uh, uh, find itself uh, through, you know, political negotiations to uh, secure uh, Taiwan back as a part as a you know, full fledged member of China. So, uh, you know, this is. Um, I think this, you know, basically it plays into the hands of Donald Trump on the Republican side because he he is consistently the most anti-war candidate out there uh, and has always been reluctant to get the United States engaged in these foreign conflicts. And I think, frankly, the majority of American people are sick and tired of sending their sons and daughters overseas to get uh, maimed or possibly killed. For what? You know, we... We wasted 20 years in Afghanistan for what? So the Taliban would have more U.S. guns and, and armaments. Uh, ditto in, in in Iraq. We invade Iraq to take out Saddam Hussein, and now we wind up uh, having, you know, we say that we view Iran as the greatest threat. Well, we've now created another great ally for Iran. So I, you know, this our foreign policy just doesn't make sense, uh, and then. Uh, you know, the prospects of having to go to war with uh, with Russia, which some people are talking about, is just it, 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 that's talk of crazy people, because uh, if the United States does that, the United States will lose and will lose badly. And, uh, you know, maybe that's what it's going to take for the United States to come to its senses. I don't know. It was interesting, um, an observation that <clears throat> Putin did not invade Ukraine while Trump was in office. He waited to do that after Trump uh, left office. And also the uh, invasion of Crimea was uh, when Obama was in office in 2014. So it's almost like the Russians always wait when the uh, Democrats are in power to do their uh, offensive uh, acts. But they, yeah. they don't do anything when uh, Trump was in office. Well, let's let's remember that when Russia did not invade uh, Georgia, it was Georgia that attacked Russia, and then the Russians responded. So that 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 particular military action was provoked. Uh, similarly, with what happened in Ukraine, uh, with, with the Biden administration, they came in with a with a decided change in policy that they were going to ramp up the confrontation with with uh, Russia. And they were going to do it through a combination of expanding NATO and then trying to, um, you know, I think they deliberately provoked 
uh, Putin into uh, launching the special military operation because the West calculated that they, they could break the Russian economy and break and destroy Putin. Turned out, boy, that was a miscalculation of uh, you know, enormous consequences. Uh, they, they couldn't do it. So uh, this is, uh, if, if you had Nikki Haley in there, she would be as bad as, you know, Obama uh, or Biden, uh, even perhaps worse. Uh, there are not too many candidates out there that are consistently anti-war uh, because the, the reality of the U.S. economy is it's heavily invested in the military industrial complex yeah. and the defense contractors continue to reap great profits. They may make crappy equipment that doesn't perform well in combat, but, you know, they do get a good return for their shareholders. So, uh, you know, this the United States is always on the move to look for a new threat that we can justify, you know, our, our defense budget. I think the, the amount appropriated right now is $880 billion, but I think in real dollars, I've heard terms, uh, amounts, uh, Jeffrey Sachs cited, uh, I think like $1.3 trillion. This is insane. We, we are we are just spending all of U.S. resources uh, uh, overseas. And while, while our own country is just going to literally hell uh, in, in terms of, you know, rising suicides, people dying from drug overdoses, uh, the country flooded, flooded with illegal immigrants, uh, crime increasing. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, the, the United States is, no, we're pretty shabby as a country right now. Yeah, it's on a massive decline. <clears throat> I, I just want to uh, real quick say, um, Larry, uh, uh, I want to encourage everybody to go to uh, the son of the new American Revolution, Sonar. Uh, he has a good uh, article that he wrote. He wrote he's answering all the questions that we're asking are on, are on that article i just i was checking that out it's called are israel and the the u.s caught in a grammar and then at the end of the article it's a cool little video <laughs> uh yeah but the, uh, uh, this uh, uh palestinian comedian comment yes. very funny very funny guy yes so i want to encourage everybody to go there and then um, that will lead me to my next question. Uh, I have a question changing a little bit. Uh, Putin has a strong has sent a strong message to Israel condemning Israel uh, action during the war, warning Israel to stop its aggression and respect international law or to expect consequences. How serious is Russia, Russia's message and what has Israel been doing that could have involved Russia to give such a warning. And what does this mean for the future of the Middle East? Yeah, so uh, first, the, the the address for my website is sonar21.com. So uh, don't forget the 2-1. Oh, yeah, um, it, it'll, be, it'll be in the description box. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Um, the What we're witnessing is the loss of U.S. prestige in the Middle East. Um, up until, you know, even during Trump's time, the United States was seen as the primary broker. If anything was going to get done on the terms of peace negotiations, the um, U.S. was going to have to have a seat at the table and would play a dominant role. Um, part of That's part of the reason they, you know, the Abraham Accords, which were negotiated, I guess, by Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, uh, looked like it was going to move the relations between the Saudis and Israelis in a new and more positive direction would have would have actually provided Israel with a measure of stability and security um, that it has not had uh, over the last 70 years. But uh, the combination of the Israeli response uh, to the uh, Hamas attack on October 7th, but even before that, what the United States did uh, in Ukraine and in backing Ukraine and in trying to destroy Russia 
emboldened Russia, sort of it, it, like it, it awoke Russia from a dream, from a sleep. And they suddenly realized that, you know what? We don't need the West. We don't need the United States. We're strong enough on our own. And on top of that, the West is trying to destroy us. So we got to defend ourselves. So in the process of defending themselves, they expanded their ties with China in a new and dramatic way. You know, let's remember that for roughly 50 years, one of the cornerstones of American foreign policy was to keep a wedge between China and Russia. The last thing we wanted to see was a unity of China and Russia working together. Well, boom. Uh, congratulations, Joe Biden. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you've accomplished, you've managed to undo uh, 50 years of uh, U.S. foreign policy in one year. So the uh, new alliance between Russia and China is now played out and had ramifications uh, in the Middle East. Uh, China in particular, but with Russia's encouragement and support, brokered a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia that effectively brought an end to the civil war in Yemen. Uh, it restored relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which had been you know, non-existent in terms of diplomatic relations. Uh, it then also uh, with Russia, it uh, led to readmitting Syria to the Arab League. You know, prior to 2022, um, most of the Arab world was still involved tacitly supporting Islamic extremists that were attacking the government of Syria. They're trying to destroy uh, Bashar al-Assad. That's over now. Uh, Bashar al-Assad is back in the good graces of the Arab League, of the uh, Organization of Islamic Countries. So, uh, again, that was another cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy, trying to uh, you know, show could punish and, and, and eliminate uh, re, uh, countries that, uh, you know, viewed as enemies or uncooperative. So uh, on, on those, you know, two issues right there, the war in Yemen, the war in Syria, the United States lost out. And mm -hmm. you, you've seen it reflected when, uh, you know, Anthony Blinken was over there trying to negotiate some sort of end to the conflict in Israel and, and Gaza. Um, when he landed in Turkey, the normal protocol would be to send out the foreign minister or someone uh, who is a high-ranking government official to welcome him to the country. Uh, they, they sent out some guy who was, you know, the deputy mayor of a local town. I mean, it was, you know, it was, a, it was one of those ways to show that we don't think anything of you. Uh, you think so that was deliberate? Really, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was deliberate. Yeah. And that then was remember deliberate. when uh, Blinken showed up, he said, oh, we're supposed to have a meeting Saturday night at like 7 p.m. with uh, Mohammed bin Salman in, in, in Riyadh. Yeah. Oh, so he shows up. <laughs> it kept him cooling his hills all night. Oh, yeah, well, it, would, it would be with you in a bit. You know, 12 hours later, okay, we'll see you. You know, again, they're just deliberately screwing with him. So uh, what, what all this means is that the United States is no longer in a, in a strong position. Russia is. And, you know, Russia is preferring to work through the United Nations, through the U.N. Security Council, and uh, <clears throat> following international law. And people say, well, how, that's, uh, how could he do that when he's violating international law in Ukraine? Well, no, he's not. That Russia had been attacked, and uh, these uh, the, the, the Ukrainians were actually on the verge in February of 2022 uh, of launching their own offensive to try to finish up destroying uh, the militias in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, um, mm. and you know Russia preempted that with a special military operation. So, I think there's growing respect for Russia among a lot of countries. And uh, Russia, as of yesterday, is now the, the chair for one year of BRICS. And they've, uh, the membership of BRICS has expanded to include Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I think the United Arab Emirates as well. So you, what you're getting is um, the, uh, the growing number of the Arab Gulf states 
are, are aligning themselves more closely with Russia and China than with the United States. Hmm. So I was, I was kind of uh, wondering about that this morning. So Iran, uh, and so Iran is, is, is not, or they are part of the BRICS. They are, they're part of BRICS now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, my my next question, Larry, is um, this morning I was reading in Doctor Falk. It's a Benjamin Netanyahu's advisor says that the IDF will be successful when Hamas is gone. He also said that Israel has to be de -radical radicalized and demilitarized the Palestinians. What are what are your thoughts on that happening? Yeah, p pigs are going to fly before that happens. You know, they'll sprout wings and fly around uh, the U.S. Capitol. You know, this, like I said, is Israel, they can't kill their way out of this. They think they can. They're trying. And all they're doing is creating uh, new generations of fighters. The, the, the countries that uh, operate under this belief, this fantasy, that if we can assassinate a key leader, assassinate a key military person, that, boy, that'll turn the war in our favor. It's pr proven, you know, throughout history to generally not be true. Uh, I know the French tried it in Algeria you know, when they were fighting the armed Islamic group. Uh, you know, again, radical, uh, they were described as radical Muslims. Uh, but who were hell bent on getting rid of French influence in Algeria? The French killed off the uh, a lot of the uh, top leadership. Well, what that did is it eliminated the guys who actually were putting the brakes on some of. They had some younger, hotter heads that were uh, advocating more extreme action, and it was the the senior leadership that put the brakes on that. Uh, well, once the those senior leaders were dead. Guess what? The younger guys took over and the war got more violent, not less violent. And France ultimately lost that war. Um, we, see, we saw the same thing, same thing with the drug cartels. Oh, one of my uh, now retired business partners uh, was the architect of the U.S. Uh, kingpin strategy. The, and the idea was to go out and arrest, take down you know, not kill, but at least take out uh, the, the heads of like, uh, you know, Pablo Escobar, the Cali cartel, uh, the Sinaloa cartel. But, but what happens is when you eliminate that top echelon of leadership, it's more like hitting, you know, a ball of mercury with a hammer. Instead of destroying the mercury, it just scatters it and they reconstitute and it becomes more difficult uh, to control. So, you know, that's what what Israel's facing now is they think that they can just kill, uh, you know, what are they going to do? Murder 2 million uh, women, children, and, and Palestinian men? Uh, make it one third of what the Jews claim they lost during the Holocaust? You know, that's that's not going to be uh, tolerated in the world, no matter how indifferent the people appear right now. Uh, so uh, I, what I think is, Israel's actions right now are threatening the very future of Israel as a state. Uh, it's eroding support for it tremendously around the world. Uh, but uh, we still haven't reached that breaking point. You know, Erdogan of Turkey talks a tough game, but uh, he hasn't followed it up with tough action, such as cutting off oil. Uh, if he decides to cut off the flow of oil to Israel, then Israel's got some real economic problems on its hands. Um, and, you know, maybe he'll do that. I don't know. But uh, as long as the United States continues, uh, l l let's think of Israel as a, as a, you know, degenerate junkie hooked on heroin. And the United States is the pusher. We're the supplier. As long as we continue to provide Israel with money and weapons, they're going to keep uh, doing the self-destructive stuff. You know, the United States is the only country that's actually in a position to stop Israel and stop it cold. But we won't do it because 
politically, it's not palatable in the United States. So this, you know, the United States is basically committing itself to a policy that is eroding U.S. influence and prestige around the world as well. Hmm. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, okay, uh, let me see. I asked you everything I wanted to regarding the Israel Hamas. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have any more questions, uh, Juan. Okay. Um, I have questions. Um, Larry, can you please talk about the Hamas underground tunnels and what Israel has done to neutralize the threat of the tunnels? I seen an article this morning. Uh, and I was I was amazed at how um, how big they were the tunnels and how sophisticated they were. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Israel has been unable to solve the tunnel problem. That's the bottom line. They've captured some. Um, you know, the idea was that some of said, "Oh, we'll just pump seawater into it and it'll fill up," thinking that this tunnel system was all one integrated system. It's not. Uh, mm -hmm. It's apparently, uh, you know, multiple. Uh, systems scattered throughout Gaza Strip. I mean, it's a that's a big expanse of territory. You know, what's remarkable, though, is that uh, it, uh, Hamas was able to construct this over the last 15 years, or at least last 12 years. I mean, it's you know, it's it's an enormous and uh, complex. So you know, Israel can't fight their way out of this. They can destroy some. They can, they can eliminate some tunnels. But uh, the others exist. They still haven't found the hostages. Still well, at least 120, 130 hostages being held. And um, it is the, the problem Israel faces when they get up uh, to any of these entrances to the tunnels uh, is that they get ambushed and they take casualties. I think that's one of the reasons that you know they're pulling, uh, they're pulling some brigades out that have been in combat now for going on three months, and now they're going to be. <laughs> this, this sort of the ironic thing: they're going to be replaced with some new guys who don't have experience who are going to go out and make the mistakes and get more of them killed and wounded, so that the Israelis will have to pull them out in another two or three months. Yeah, they just—it's uh, an untenable uh, military strategy. Israel doesn't have a large enough army to uh, destroy the Gaza Strip. And moreover, it can't afford the political consequences of killing all the Palestinians, which is what it would have to do. Um, so it's just, you know, this, uh, this thing is not going to get resolved in a way that's going to be favorable to Israel. Yeah, I also read somewhere um, that they were using the rubbish or the the, the destruction, the rubbish, and they were hiding, they were hiding behind, you know, inside the rubbish, you know, and attacking also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, that's the problem with, well, when you, when you create all this rubble, destroy all these buildings, uh, it, it, you know, you create obstacles that tanks will have trouble driving over. And then when you have to go to try to clear a path, you realize, there's just certain defined lanes of travel. So it's easy to set up ambushes at those points. Uh, that's one of, you know, you'd think people would have learned that as a lesson of urban combat, but clearly the Israelis didn't. We also have a question in the comment section. It says, um, can Saudi Arabia reject a request of any kind against the USA as America is responsible for their security and a key operator of the Saudi oil industry. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Saudis are distancing themselves from the United States every day. That's why they're, they're growing alliance with uh, both China and Russia. So, uh, you know, I don't think, I think the U.S. security for their oil industry is grossly exaggerated. Um, um, they're, they're getting, they get more security by having a peaceful arrangement with Iran. Iran is who they really feared. And bringing an end to the war with uh, their support for the government of Yemen uh, and the war against the Houthis 
you know, previously the Houthis were, you know, with some regularity attacking Saudi oil fields. And so it was, you know, the Saudis put in Patriot missile batteries that didn't work. <laughs> you couldn't shoot down some of the Houthi missiles. So, you know, this, uh, I, I think what, what we're seeing is Saudis, by virtue of joining BRICS, are now moving into a new world order that does not, is not controlled or dominated by the United States as it once was. Uh, Paulo, question, do you think BRICS is going to replace the G7, G20 group of nations as like the predominant economic bloc? Well, I, I think it's going, to, it's going to become, I think it's well on its way to becoming the dominant economic bloc because it has the most industrial capability. So when, when you consider the industrial capability of China, Russia, India, and Brazil, uh, there's no, no alliance in the West that can even match it. The United States and Europe um, are, you know, right now are hard pressed. They can't even, factories in the United States and Europe can't even produce enough artillery shells to keep up with the demand from Ukraine, whereas Russia outproduces both the United States and uh, the Europeans on just that that account alone. Yeah, but it's the same across the board. So uh, what we're seeing is th this emergence as a new world order, it's, it's going to make the G7 less and less relevant. Larry, um, I was going to ask you, is uh, Kim Jong recent and explicit statement ordering his military leaders to prepare plan of a nuclear attack on South Korea paired with North Korea actual ICBM capability, proper reconnaissance capability and nuclear capability cause for concern even more so than before due to the expansion of the U.S. Korea, South Korea military drills. Is the U.S. provoking North Korea, North Korea and why the strong words against coming from the president of North Korea at this time. Yeah, I don't know what moved him off. Uh, you know, he's been watching, um, let's call it U.S. aggression in the region. And you know, just sending it, I think it was his way to speak out and say, hey, I'm still, still here, I'm still relevant. I, I don't think he's going to launch any nukes at South Korea simply because it would endanger North Korea and probably end in the life of the North Korean people along with uh, the South Koreans. Um, but he is uh, showing that he's a player. Um, what, what's interesting is the relationship now between North Korea and Russia is stronger. That's improving. And uh, we'll find that, that Putin may actually be in a position to help restrain or rein in uh, the, the North Koreans. So, uh, but, you know, clearly the efforts of South Korea and Japan to strengthen their military alliance with the United States has, I think, been a factor in provoking uh, this response by North Korea. And then um, if you don't have any more questions, Bach, I just have one more. I think, no, I've exhausted all my questions. I appreciate <laughs> okay. I, ha I have one more question, uh, Larry. Uh, could you give us just like a, a detail or, or just like a short what do you think about uh, Putin's uh, speech that he gave on New Year's? Well, uh, I haven't read that. I, I read his uh, remarks. With He went to the military hospital to visit right. uh, the veterans that had been wounded. Uh, pretty remarkable speech. People you know, ought to read that. Um, the, the thing to remember about Putin is he means what he says. He, he's not Mr. Nuance. He's, he's not sending secret messages uh, wrapped in some sort of obscure language. He's, he's very direct. And um, he recognizes very clearly that Russia is in a war of survival against the West. They're not fighting Ukraine. They're fighting the United States and NATO. And he's very clear about that. In fact, he went to some lengths to, to say that uh, he does not view Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, as the enemy. They're not. It's the West that's the enemy. And 
So he's speaking about that now in a way that uh, he never really has before. And, and that th his view is reflected in remarks by uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and former President Medvedev uh, that uh, the Russians are awake and realize that th there's not a negotiated outcome here or one where you cut a deal and that they make some concessions and the West makes some concessions and everybody comes to a happy ending. That's not going to happen. Um, they're going to uh, destroy Ukraine's military capability. And in the process of that, they are doing uh, a destruction of NATO's capabilities because it's really NATO's using Ukraine as a proxy army in this fight. And so... Um, by destroying the Ukrainian military, you're, you're actually in, indirectly destroying NATO. And that's going to force NATO to have to do a real reappraisal. You know, there's some that are, again, talking very, uh, with a lot of bellicosity. Oh, boy, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to we need to get ready to go to war with Russia. You know, that's what, that's what this crazy general out of the Netherlands said. Well, good luck with that sport. You don't have a damn, a damn army worth, worth anything. And your air force is weak. What are you going to fight with? You know, same for the Brits. They could barely field thirty thousand guys. You know, Russia. Let's put it this way: the entire British army that they could put in the field right now is about half the size of what Russia is recruiting every month. So Russia's Russia's bringing in you know over forty one thousand soldiers a month. And the Brits have a total of 30,000 that they think they can put in the field. Again, these people, they're, they're challenged with math. They can't even do basic addition and subtraction, for God's sake. Um, so uh, the, the other thing that uh, Putin said to the, to the wounded soldiers was, um, I'm not, you know, we've been attacked with a terrorist attack by Ukrainian bombing civilians in Belgorod, and Donetsk, uh, you know, using using these uh, cluster munitions that the United States the pledge would not be used against civilians, but it's absolutely being used against civilian and civilian targets that have no military significance. Ukraine tries to make the case, oh, well, Russia's doing the same. Oh, really? So, like, Russia bombed a hotel uh, in Kharkiv the other day that was known to be a headquarters for Western uh, uh, militants that are supporting the Ukrainians, uh, as well as um, uh, some other Ukrainian military and security personnel. Well, you, Ukraine came out and said, oh, you hit a civilian target. Okay, give us the list of civilian deaths. Oh, well, they're not, they're not ready to issue that list because once they issue the list, you'll find out the identities of uh, uh, of these uh, various uh, soldiers of fortune are now soldiers of misfortune. So uh, Putin made it very clear. He says, look, we're not going to launch attacks against civilian centers just to kill civilians. He says, we're not, you know, I, he says, I have no stomach for killing a mother walking her baby in a, in a pram. Uh, we're, we're going to hit, we're going to use targeted strikes we're going to hit military and intelligence targets. We're going to hit targets of Western uh, military uh, supporters. Uh, so, uh, and we're going to going to go after critical infrastructure. And you know, he's very clear on that. So, the West better wake up and listen. And every each attack that uh, the Ukrainians carry out against civilian targets in Russia elicits a bigger response. Just today. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. over the last three days, Russia has just unleashed a torrent of missiles and rockets mm -hmm. and drones. Uh, today's attack was probably twice as large as what they launched yesterday, which was twice as large as what they launched uh, on uh, the uh, 31st of December. So, you know, R Russia, Russia ain't playing. They are, uh, Putin also said in one of his interviews that I was watching, he said that the West... It's impossible. They would. They will not win. I don't yeah. know if you see when he yeah, made that I, statement. I, I've heard. I've heard that. Yeah. Well, well, that's true. I mean, that's what I said. Pay attention to what Putin says. Uh, right. The Russians 
this is, you know, Putin's not the, you know, he's not the glue that holds Russia together. He's really more, he's emblematic uh, of the Russians. Um, he is, he's actually probably much more measured and calm. Uh, he's not given to emotional outbursts or rants. Uh, people like Medvedev, <laughs> he's, he's the emotional guy. And then, you know, when he's pissed, you absolutely know it. And he might even do something a little irrational in a, in a you know, in a, moment of anger but uh th that said the you, you putin is committed to this defeat of uh ukraine and they're, they're moving about it very methodically um we, i just have one more question for sure. you and i'm sorry about that um mr messina he's a he's a subscriber mr messina wants to wants to know do you see israel as it stands pulling out of its troops from northern Gaza as a sign of defeat? Yeah, I do. You know, remember, uh, Israel's stated objective was to destroy Hamas. Well, when you're having to withdraw troops, you'd, you'd withdraw them if you destroyed Hamas, but they haven't destroyed Hamas. And there are still rockets being fired from that territory into uh, Tel Aviv. So, <laughs> you know... It, it's exposing Israel as uh, the, the Israelis. I don't know if you've ever dealt with them. I have. Uh, uh, humility is not one of their strong suits. Let's put it that way. Uh, they are the, the arrogance factor is remarkable. I, I posted a video last week uh, of this one Israeli firearms instructor explaining why what the Israelis do is when they carry uh, when they carry a pistol. The pistol has a magazine, you know, and so when you um, when you go to put that magazine in, that doesn't mean the gun's loaded. You have to take the slide, pull the slide back, let it go, and that moves forward, chambers around. Well, the Israelis train their soldiers to not carry a live round in the pistol. They say... No, wait until you draw the gun, and as you're drawing it, then rack the slide and then chamber the round there. Well, the reason they do that is because, A, they don't have, a, he's he admitted this, they don't have enough time to train their soldiers to mm -hmm. operate safely. So, therefore, this is like, uh, this is like a special needs child where you have to make some uh, uh, adjustments and accommodations for them. Well, sorry, when you're carrying a firearm, you either better know how to operate it safely, which means you have a round chambered that because in, in, in a moment of threat, you have to get that firearm out quickly and, and shoot it. You don't have time to rack the slide. If you are not competent to do that, you shouldn't even have a damn gun. Shouldn't even be carrying one. That's an example of what's going on with the Israeli military. They're training them to the lowest standard possible. And as such, you know, they're they're up against some Hamas fighters, which are actually pretty good. And Hamas is, you know, Hamas, frankly, is uh, it's a win for Hamas if Israel doesn't win. So, Larry, do you have a book coming out soon? Nope, nope. It's just uh, I'm doing confining myself right now to uh, writing and posting at Sonar Twenty One. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time and your knowledge, and um, everything Sonar Twenty One, everything uh, your YouTube channel, and everything will be in the description box. All right, guys. Listen, thank you for having me, and Happy New Year. Happy New and Year. Thank you, Larry. We appreciate you. All righty. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.